Hello you guys. Here's your video lesson for section 6.4 um, and it is entitled Properties of Special Parallelograms. So this is picking up on where we left off with 6.2 and 6.3 about parallelograms. Missy McCarthy, Okemos High School Math Instructor. So our objectives in this particular section are going to be to prove and apply properties of rectangles, rhombuses, and squares, and also to use properties of rectangles, rhombuses, and squares to solve problems. So as you've probably guessed by now, those rhombuses, rectangles, and squares are going to be our special parallelograms. Um, okay, so we're going to start off with the review of the properties of parallelograms. So here we have a, a, a figure. It is a parallelogram, A, B, C, D. Oops, I thought I grabbed the color there. Let's see if I can grab a color. Okay, so here we have parallelogram A, B, C, D. And we know that it is a parallelogram because of the definition. It has two pairs of parallel sides. That is the definition of a parallelogram. Now what we talked about in the previous lessons is that the parallelograms uh, have four other properties. So the first property of a parallelogram, if it is a parallelogram, we know that both pairs of opposite sides are congruent. Okay. If it is a parallelogram, we also know that both pairs of opposite angles are congruent. Okay. The third property of parallelograms is that, um, let's see, I know that the diagonals bisect each other. And the fourth is that consecutive angles are supplementary. So those are the four properties along with the definition of a parallelogram. Okay. All right, now one of our special parallelograms, special parallelogram number one, is known as the rectangle. And you guys have been learning about rectangles and talking about rectangles since early grade school. Well, the definition of a rectangle is actually very specific, although you may say several things about uh, rectangles, there is very specific um, definition for the rectangle. And the rectangle is nothing more than a quadrilateral. with four right angles. Any quadrilateral with four right angles is considered a parallelogram. I'm sorry, is considered a rectangle. Sorry about that. And that is the definition of a rectangle. Now, because a rectangle is a parallelogram, we can say that all of the properties for parallelograms hold true. All properties that we just discussed on the previous page for parallelograms hold true. So every single thing we said on the other page is true about the rectangle. But in addition, there are a couple other things that are true about um, rectangles, or one other thing maybe I should say. So the only other thing we need to add to the list for the rectangle is that its diagonals are congruent. It's not true about all parallelograms just about rectangles. Okay, so this is the the nugget that we're adding to the list. All the other stuff is true plus the diagonals of a rectangle are congruent. So let's go ahead and list the properties. One, if it's a rectangle, we know 
that, um, actually, let's just draw it instead of listing it all out. So if we have a figure A, B, C, D, okay, and we know it's a rectangle because it has four right angles, what are some of the things that we can conclude? We can conclude that A, B is congruent to D, C, and we can also conclude that AD is congruent to BC. Opposite sides are congruent. We already know that opposite angles are congruent. That angle A is congruent to C and angle B is congruent to D because they're all right angles. We also already know that consecutive angles, angle B and angle C, add up to 180. We already know that because they're both 90 degrees. And then if we were to draw these diagonals in here, we also know that AC is congruent to BD, and that's because it's a rectangle. This right here is unique to rectangles. And then the other thing we know is that if we were to call this intersection point here E, we know that AE is congruent to EC, and we also know that BE is congruent to ED. So I didn't list the things about the angles. I just listed what we knew about the sides, but the angles piece, we know that angle A is congruent to angle C. Angle D is congruent to angle B. And this is basically because all right angles are congruent. And we also know that um, angles A and D are supplementary along with angles B um, and C. They're also supplementary. Okay, so that's just confirming all of those different properties about rectangles and about parallelograms. So that's our first special parallelogram. Our second special parallelogram is something called the rhombus. So the rhombus actually um, is a parallelogram, definitely, but it has the definition of a rhombus is that it has four congruent sides. So a rhombus is nothing more than a parallelogram with four congruent sides, or a quadrilateral, maybe I should say. Ugh, I know that color doesn't show up well, so I'm going to grab white here. Okay, so the definition of a rhombus is a quadrilateral with four congruent sides. Okay. And the very first thing we want to point out is that a rhombus is a parallelogram. So the same properties, again, that hold for a parallelogram also hold for a rhombus. So properties apply to rhombuses. Okay. So we have all those properties, but we also may have a couple of additional properties that apply to a rhombus. So let's look at what those are. If you have a rhombus, we know lots of things occur. So, ooh, I don't know how that turned up like that. Okay, so that's congruent to that, it's congruent to that. So we got A, B, C, D. We can say that lots of things are true. I'm not going to go through all of the parallelogram properties. But in addition to the parallelogram properties, we can say something else about a rhombus that isn't true about a rectangle. Um, and that is in a rhombus, the um, two diagonals are actually perpendicular. So in a rhombus, BD is perpendicular to AC. Or in other words, we can say the diagonals are perpendicular. 
They still bisect each other. Um, opposite sides are still congruent. Opposite angles are still congruent. Consecutive angles are still supplementary. But we have one additional property here is that the angles bisect each, I'm sorry, the diagonals are perpendicular. And then something else happens with the angles in a rhombus. If we were to, I'm trying to grab colors that are easy to read. I'm sorry, you guys. But if we were to label these angles, let's say 1 and 2, and label these angles 5 and 6, and then I'm going to go through and grab another color. Let's call these 7 and 8, and let's call these here 3 and 4. If you're in a rhombus, then these diagonals are not only perpendicular to each other, but they also bisect all of the vertices. So in this case, we can say that angle 3 is congruent to angle 4. We can also say that angle 7 is congruent to angle 8. And then we can say that angle 1 is congruent to angle 2 and angle 5 is congruent to angle 6. So these are new properties that are unique to a rhombus and all of the other parallel properties apply. Okay. All right, now if we start with quadrilateral, which is where we started, and we go down to a parallelogram where it is a quadrilateral with two sets of parallel sides, from there, we discussed what a rhombus is, a parallelogram with four congruent sides, and we discussed what a rectangle is, a parallelogram with four right angles. If we were to put these two guys together, you would have the square. So the rhombus properties come here for congruent sides, and the rectangle properties come here for right angles, and we have our third special parallelogram, which is called a square. Now, as you might have guessed, because a square is a combination of rectangles and rhombuses, which also lives here inside the parallelogram and also lives here inside the quadrilateral family, this guy here is super special because he inherits the properties. He inherits the properties of the rectangle and the properties of a rhombus. So there's some properties that are unique to rectangles. There's some properties that are unique to rhombuses, but the square inherits them both. Okay, so if you read through here, you can see each definition, a quadrilateral, four-sided uh, four figure, parallelogram, two pairs of parallel sides. So that makes it even more specific, and it has other properties. Then the rectangles, we just talked about its properties. The definition is that it has four right, it's a parallelogram with four right angles. And then the rhombus, we talked about its properties. It's a parallelogram with four congruent sides. And then the square is a combination of both of those. So it has all of the properties of a rhombus, a rectangle, a parallelogram, and a quadrilateral. OK, so if we were to look at this object here, what is it safe to assume? Well, if I were to tell you, first of all, I would have to give you some information here. OK, and let's call this square A, B, C, D. Okay. There are a lot of things that we can assume. We can assume all the properties about a parallelogram. We can assume all the properties about um, a rectangle and all the properties about a rhombus. So I'm going to go and see, I'm just going to do the rectangle and the rhombus properties. So we can assume that, oh, I didn't draw that very well. Okay. We can assume that segment AC is congruent to segment BC. Oh, I should have put AB, we should put a C here and a D here. My bad. So we can say that segment AC is congruent to BD, and we can all, um, that's because the diagonals are congruent. So that's one thing that's unique to a rectangle. Then we can also say, if I call this point E here, or we can actually just say AC is perpendicular to BD. So this guy comes from the fact that it's a rectangle. And this guy comes from the fact that it's a rhombus. Okay. 
Okay. And then another thing that we can say, if we were to call, we could say angle A, E, ooh, nope, I want to go the other way. Let's call it angle D, A, E is congruent to angle B, A, E. So that says that this guy right here is congruent to this guy here which is also congruent to angle DCE, which is also congruent to angle BCE. That means these guys here are also congruent. And then lastly, we can say that these are congruent and these are congruent. So let me write that out. It's tri that's angle A, D, E is congruent to angle C, D, E, which is congruent to angle A, B, E, which is congruent to angle, oops, I didn't put my angle mark in there, angle C, B, E. So we've got all of those pairs of congruent angles, and that comes from the fact that this guy is also a rhombus. So there's lots of things that are safe to assume based on the fact that it's a square. All right, we're going to skip this one with what you can assume. I think you guys get the point. So let's look at this particular problem here where we have a triangle. I'm sorry, uh, we have a rhombus. It says TVX, uh, WX is a rhombus and we need to find the measure of TV and we also need to find the measure of VTZ. So, TV is this segment here, um, and because it's a rhombus, that means that all the sides are congruent. So that means that XT is also congruent to WV, because it's a rhombus. So I can say 3B plus 4 is equal to 13B minus 9, which gives us 10B equals 13, if I add 9 over there and subtract that. So if we divide both sides by 10, then we get B is equal to 1.3. So if we plug the 1.3 back in, we would do 13 times 1.3, oh, which is going to give us like 16.9, I believe. Yep, 16.9, and then we have to subtract 9. So that's going to give us 7.9. So if I did that correctly, that means that all of the sides are 7.9 because it is a rhombus, which means TV is measured at 7.9. Okay, now we can find angle VTZ, VTZ based on the fact that we know that this here is a right angle. So let's see if we can write this in here. This is, come on, give me the red pen. This is a right angle here because the diagonals um, of a rhombus are perpendicular. And so that means we can say that 14A plus 20 is equal to 90. That means 14A is equal to 70, and that means A is equal to, I believe that's 5. A is equal to 5. Okay, so now that we know A is 5, we also know that angle XTZ is congruent to WTZ. So I'll grab another color here. So I can um, find the angle of the measure of what next? Hmm, we know that's 90. We've got to have some more information here. What else can we conclude? Oh, duh. Plug it in there so we get 5 times 5 minus 5, which is 25 minus 5, which is 20. So that's the measure of angle XTZ, which is equal to VTZ. So the measure of angle VTZ is 20 degrees. I said that and then my mind went blank. 
Okay, so here is our last one. We need to show that the diagonals of EFGH are congruent and perpendicular bisectors of each other. So we've got quite a bit to show. So the very first thing we could do, and I'll probably just outline this, in order to show that they're congruent, we need to find the distance of segment FH and find the distance of segment E G. So we would do that by doing the distance formula and we have the coordinates. So FH is going to be negative 1 minus 0 quantity squared plus 3 minus a negative 4 quantity squared. And then EG would be negative 4 minus 3 ooh, sorry about that quantity squared plus negative 1 minus 0 quantity squared. So if you were to find this, the um, values here, you would see that those would end up being congruent. I think they would both end up being the square root of 50. Mm, I could be wrong, but I think that's what they would end up being. Okay, so we would have just shown then that the diagonals are congruent. And then we've got to show that they're perpendicular bisectors. So in order to show that they're perpendicular, what I would probably do next to show that they're perpendicular is find the slopes. I don't like that color. So I'm going to find the slopes of FH, which is going to end up being the change in Y, so 3 minus a negative 4 over the change in X, which is negative 1 minus 0. So we end up with 7 over negative 1, so negative 7. And then I'm going to find the slope of the other EG. So that's going to end up being the change in Y, negative 1 minus 0 over the change in X, negative 4 minus 3, which is going to end up being negative 1 over negative 7, which is 1, 7. So that satisfies our second condition that shows that they are perpendicular. And then the last thing we would have to do is show that they are bisectors. To, to show that they are bisectors of each other, we would have to show that they intersect at their midpoint. So, hmm, let's see. I would find the midpoint of FH and the midpoint of EG and show that they are the same. Okay, So the midpoint of FH is going to end up being negative 1 plus 0 over 2 and 3 minus 4 over 2 or plus a negative 4 and then the midpoint of EG is going to end up being what? We would have negative 4 plus 3 over 2 and negative 1 plus 0 over 2 now, did I add those right? Negative 1 and 0, and the uh, y is 3 and negative 4, and then the x is negative 4 and 3, and then the y is negative 1 and 0. And so this gives us a negative 1 half, and this gives us a negative 1 half, and then this gives us a negative 1 half, and a negative 1 half. So they have the same midpoint, so that shows that they are bisectors. The slopes are opposite reciprocal, that shows that they're perpendicular, and the distances are the same, and that shows that they are congruent. Okay? There is no final slide for this. I just want you guys to come in tomorrow prepared to work on some problems dealing with the special um, parallelograms, a rectangle, a rhombus, and a square. See you tomorrow.